Good evening. I'm John Stern, the new board chair of the Filson Historical Society. Thank you for joining us this evening for the Gertrude Pope Brown lecture series featuring Arthur Rick Perlstein in his latest book, Reagan Land, America's Right Turn, 1976 to 1980. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that yesterday's events in Washington remind us that if we can learn from history, society will be the beneficiary. Certainly there was divisiveness in 1976 to 1980, but what has made 2021 so different from then? This evening's presentation on politics then might shed some light on what has changed today. This lecture series was initiated in 1993 as a memorial to the life of Gertrude Pope Brown and is made possible by the continuous generous support of her family, Dace Brown Stubbs, G. Garvin Brown IV, Laura Lee Brown, Garvin Dieters, Laura Lee Gastis, and Polk Dieters. This series has brought internationally recognized historians to Louisville. More than 36,000 citizens have learned more about the significant stories of our region, nation, and world because of this lecture series. At the conclusion of this lecture, Dick Clay, president and CEO of Filson, will moderate questions as time permits. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce Rick Perlstein as our Gertrude Pope Brown speaker. Rick is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan, Nixon Land, The Rise of a President and the Fracturing of America, a New York Times bestseller, picked as one of the best nonfiction books of 2007 by over a dozen publications. And Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of the American Consensus which won the 2001 Los Angeles Times Book Award for History and appeared on the best books of the year lists of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Chicago Tribune. His essays and book reviews have been published in the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Nation, the Village Voice, and Slate, among others. Now, it is indeed my pleasure to turn the program over to Rick. Thank you, John. Thank you to the Brown family uh, for sponsoring this distinguished lecture series. It's, it's an incredible honor to be here. Uh, when I came out with this book in August, uh, one of the heartbreaking things was not being able to, play, uh, to travel to cities that I'd never been to, like Louisville. Uh, I was looking forward to sampling some of that bourbon as soon as I got your call. Uh, I got some in reserve for after the lecture. Very glad to be here. Now, I've been prepared to give the same presentation I've been giving since August on my book, Reagan Land, and uh, the series that it culminates about the rise of the American right since the 1950s. Uh, I even prepared a beautiful slideshow for you. But uh, yes, uh, as John indicated, we had a remarkable day yesterday, and I changed my plans. Uh, I decided I had to speak only secondly as a historian and, and first as a citizen, uh, because I think that January 6th, 2021, really will really go down in history as, as one of those dates that school children memorize, like July 4th, 1776, or April 12th, 1861, to December 7th, 1941, September 11th, 2001. Uh, I noticed on the Philston's website uh, this notice of the topics the Philston presents are often difficult and frequently resonate with issues facing us today. This is by design. Uh, we have invited our presenters to engage honestly and respectively, respectfully with sometimes uncomfortable topics. Uh, I appreciate that uh, because that's what I'm gonna be doing with you uh, today uh, in light of the history I've been studying in my career. Uh, what we saw yesterday was uh, a violent mob encouraged by the President of the United States 
operationalize, operationalizing a belief held by a lion's share of his fellow Republican elected officials that he, Donald Trump, should remain president of the United States despite only winning a minority of the electoral votes cast by the states. And I think the understandable initial, initial response of many of us was this is not America. That's certainly something I heard a lot in the media today. Unfortunately, what I want to explore tonight is how what happened yesterday at our Capitol is very American. It is part of our American patrimony and it is crucial for us as citizens to understand this no less than with the aim of preserving our very constitutional republic. The very American theme I want to preserve, pursue tonight uh, is our nation's history of what I'll call reactionary minoritarianism. That's a mouthful. Uh, by reactionary, I simply mean opposing liberal reform by any means necessary. Minoritarian, that's simple. That means quite simply seeking to keep and gain power in a democratic republic, despite not having a majority support. And this goes back 240 years. Uh, the only reason we have a United States of America, though never quite as united as we'd wish or like to believe, managed to get created was you know, something we all learned in school. Uh, these kind of compromises uh, between the slave South and the non-slave North. Uh, the first was of course, the creation of a Senate, uh, a body that at first was not elected directly by the citizens, but by the state legislators that didn't change until uh, the 20th century. And uh, to elect presidents, presidents according to something called the Electoral College in which each state would get a number of votes equal to its two senators plus the number of members of Congress it had, which is proportionate to its population. Which as more and more of us are beginning to ponder is you know, an inherently not quite democratic situation, right? Uh, of course it was very undemocratic back when senators weren't voted by citizens. But it's even, you know, democratic, not quite democratic now when, you know, in a state like, you know, Wyoming, uh, they get to cast three electoral votes uh, for president. Uh, California, uh, with, you know, many, 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 many times the population uh, does not cast a number of elector votes, votes commensurate with their population. We don't have one person, one vote when it comes to electing the president. Uh, and then going back to that constitutional convention, most notoriously, we have the three fifths clause. What that meant is that each enslaved person uh, for the um, purposes of proportion of members of Congress would count as three fifths of a person. So we have minoritarianism at the very level of the human soul itself. And through that process, something was institutionalized in the psyche of the South itself, that they were entitled to an equal say, or even a dominant say in the institutions of the country, no matter what, no matter their share of the population. Of course, very soon uh, in the 19th century, this drove an exacerbating crisis between the North and the South, the sectional crisis. As historians more and more understand, one of the drivers of this crisis was that Southern agriculture, uh, the soil, the very soil itself was growing exhausted. The South was growing weaker economically as its ag agricultural resources and productivity was exhausted vis-a-vis -vis the industrial system of the North. Uh, and the consequence of that for the South was that in many respects, it, it became an imperial section of the country. It sought to expand its number of senators, expand its votes for president via the Electoral College by trying to create new slave states to the West to expand slavery, 
to guarantee that the South would control the Senate and control the presidency and basically control the nation, uh, which is pretty much the way things worked for the first half of the 19th century. Congress was in the 19th century as it was for most of the 20th century, and we'll discuss that later, dominated by Southerners. Um, now here's, um, here's where things get very uncomfortable. It was when that strategy no longer became viable as politics, viable as a legal strategy, viable as an electoral strategy with the election of a president, namely Abraham Lincoln, on a platform of opposing the spread of slavery to the West, that the strategy of reactionary minoritarian took its darkest turn. It began to be pursued through force of arms, beginning with the fire, firing upon Fort Sumter. Then following the Confederacy's loss and the successful end of the attempt by the federal government to require the South to build a society upon the principle of equal citizenship for all its residents, known as Reconstruction, or I should say at least it's male residents, uh, we saw something uh, very striking. We saw the metastasizing of the reactionary minoritarian system in the South. We saw the creation of a single party, almost totalitarian political system. The system was known as Jim Crow. Now the part about the system of Jim Crow we remember best is the way it stripped equal citizenship rights from African-Americans, often through profoundly violent means. But it's also important to remember that it wasn't only African-Americans exercising their citizenship rights who were the subjects of state terror. It was also people who tried to vote for another political party. It was Republicans. The former Confederacy was a one-party dictatorship in many ways. And its annals are full of stories of people casting what they thought was a secret ballot for Republicans and being visited at their homes by mobs or having their loans called in or having their businesses blacklisted. The fear, of course, was the possibility of a coalition of white and black under the Republican banner that would threaten rule by the white minority and that would threaten the South's minority domination of the American political system. And again, as with the Civil War, it was at the moment when reactionary minoritarianism lost its ability to check the spread of liberal reform, to check equal citizenship by peaceful means that violent means came to the fore. That's what we know as, as the uh, redemption period in the South, the Jim Crow period, the terrible history of lynching that we're only now beginning to reckon with as a nation. Strikingly, this reactionary minoritarianism was enforced within the Democratic Party itself. It was only in 1936 that the party abolished a rule that had been in effect since 1832 that required a candidate to win at least two thirds of the convention delegates in order to become the party's presidential nominee. This was a veto that the South had to guarantee that the Democrats would not nominate a presidential candidate, let alone the nation elect a president who might threaten the system of minoritarian reaction. Later developments showed the wisdom of that two thirds rule, at least the wisdom if you were a white southerner hoping to sustain reactionary minoritarianism. Subsequently, over the New Deal and the wartime period, the Northern liberal wing of the Democratic Party, which included an African-American constituency in the big cities, increased its power vis-a-vis -vis that of the white South. In 1948, at the convention, one of its rising young stars, a Senate candidate from Minnesota, in fact, the mayor of Minneapolis, Hubert Humphrey, gave a speech uh, as part of a platform debate to pass a civil rights plank for the first time for the Democratic Party platform. He uttered a famous line, the time has arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadow of states' rights and to walk forthrightly 
into the bright sunshine of human rights. People, human beings, this is the issue of the 20th century. Well, a faction of reactionary minoritarians led by Senator Strom Thurmond walked forthrightly out of the convention. Uh, they formed their own political party. It was called the Dixiecrats, and they ran Strom Thurmond as their presidential candidate. Uh, and that heralded the arrival of another interesting reactionary minoritarian innovation. Uh, the idea that now that the Democrats might uh, nominate candidates who might threaten the reactionary minoritarian governance of the South, um, Southerners began to contemplate a strategy of what became known as the faithless elector. Having a presidential elector uh, cast his vote in the electoral college for not the party's nominee, but a candidate satisfying to the South. In 1952, a presidential elector for Alabama named Edmund Blair refused to pledge to vote in the electoral college for the presidential nominee of the Democratic Party. This was even before they had a nominee. Uh, and it was a strategy uh, to refuse his support should that nominee not support white supremacy. Uh, the Alabama Democratic Party was not pleased. Uh, it took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. They won. The Supreme Court determined that states could pass laws requiring electors to take a pledge to vote for the national party's nominee. It was not, it didn't require them to pass such a pledge, but it allowed states to, pa uh, to, to pass a law saying if you're an elector and your state votes for a majority for a certain presidential candidate, you have to vote for that candidate in the electoral college. Uh, strikingly, um, something happened in the interim before the next presidential election that uh, changed the tune of the Alabama Democratic Party. First, they sued in order to support the national party. But of course, in 1954, the Supreme Court handed down Brown versus the Board of Education. In 1955, it passed the uh, Brown II decision, which dictated that Southern schools must integrate with all deliberate speed. And as night follows day, what came next was one of the most awful periods in our nation's history, a movement known as massive resistance, which was quite simply massive resistance to the authority of the federal government as expressed by its Republican and Democratic institutions. Um, I'm gonna just read a, a quick example of what uh, massive resistance uh, looked like on the ground. Uh, it's from a very typical uh, Southern newspaper column. This one happened to be from Talladega, Alabama uh, by a columnist named J.L. Wallace. It's dated September 27th, 1954. The enemies of the South and the enemies of Alabama have found a soft spot in our traditional defenses the attack will likely be centered on this proud state, which now is mired up to its ears in political crime and corruption. With non-segregated classrooms, we are accepting amalgamation with its curse to last until doomsday. We are accepting the end of our way of life and the end of civilization as we know it. Let's um, put a pin in that apocalyptic rhetoric. It's uh, going to be very important uh, in the rest of the story as I narrate it. That's 1954. Uh, I recently uh, studied the Emmett Till case. Uh, as we know, uh, that was a case in which a young African-American boy visiting uh, from Chicago uh, was supposedly, although uh, the woman in question recently before her death uh, recanted, uh, whistled at a woman, a white woman, and uh, he was lynched. He was thrown into the river. And I studied the trial and what was very striking about the rhetoric of the successful um, defense of the gentleman who had actually thrown Emmett Till in the river uh, was how similar it was to the kind of QAnon conspiracy theories we're, ha we're hearing today. Uh, the notion that uh, um, snatching a kid and claiming that he'd been murdered was just the sort of thing these Yankees would do 
in order to take aim at the Southern way of life, to make the South look bad. Emmett Till's mother appeared on the witness stand. She displayed the signet ring that Emmett Till was wearing when he died. It was his father's signet ring, his late father. He had always wanted to wear it. Finally, when he was big enough, his mom gave it to him as a gift when he went down south to visit his relatives. It was found on his corpse. This was all related to the jury. One of the jury was asked by the Associated Press what she thought about her testimony. And uh, the juror said she was probably just making it up because she hadn't cried. Right? So that was the kind of derangement that the ideology of white supremacy had created, this ideology of reactionary minoritarianism. And how did this play out on the national level? In both 1956 and 1960, organized movements spread up, spread up among Southern elites to encourage faithless electors. Uh, immediately after the 1960 election, electors from Alabama and Mississippi agreed not to cast their votes for Kennedy, who had won both states. Again, this is what you know, Donald Trump was asking electors to do uh, yesterday. I'm sorry, on, on January 3rd, when the electoral colleges met in the states. All of Mississippi's eight electors and six of Alabama's elect 11 electors were unpledged. They could vote for whoever they wanted. The electors lobbied their counterparts in the Electoral College to follow their lead. Uh, organizers, was, uh, organizers of the movement came up with a three-point plan to give the South a partial vote in the fairs of the nation. Uh, plan A was for electors from 11 Southern states to use their clout to persuade Kennedy to sap the USA to communist countries and to support states' rights. If Kennedy refused, the electors would move to Plan B, a resolution calling for, quote, reversing the position of candidates in the election, that is Vice President Lyndon Johnson of Texas would be president and Kennedy would be vice president. If that didn't work, finally, there was a Plan C. Republican electors from all 50 states would be invited to meet in Chicago to pick a president from a list of outstanding Southern men, including uh, Harry Flood Byrd, the segregationist governors Orville Faubus of Arkansas and Ross Barnett of Mississippi, Senator Richard Russell. And Kennedy's assistant, Ted Sorensen, said this had been a real threat. They were literally afraid that the Electoral College might meet and Ted, uh, that John F. Kennedy would not uh, win in the Electoral College um, because of this minoritarian reactionary sabotage. Um, the reactionary minoritarians of the South felt even more threatened uh, when Kennedy became president uh, and uh, in a development that wouldn't have been predicted at the time because Kennedy was a very reluctant warrior for civil rights. Uh, the pace of massive resistance in the South increased uh, because of the uh, pressure of Martin Luther King's freedom movement, most dramatically in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, where uh, Martin Luther King sent children into the streets to march for public accommodations to be open to all, regardless of race. They were viciously attacked by police dogs, by fire hoses, we all seen the video. And almost immediately upon that, uh, the new governor of Alabama, George Wallace, who we'll hear from again in this story, uh, was uh, inaugurated uh, on uh, a memorial to the Confederacy and declared segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And um, it, Birmingham became one of the signposts of, again, those moments when minoritarian reaction retreats from the parliamentary strategy, the strategy of law, the strategy of election, and seeks to achieve its defiance through violent force. Little Rock, Alabama in 1957, Anniston, Alabama in 1961, when integrated bus riders on Greyhound buses uh, were set upon by mobs and their bus firebombed, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, in Selma, Alabama, all because the reactionary minoritarians no longer had a political party of their own to press their parliamentary 
their parliamentary parliamentarian cause within the normal routines of politics. This is the story as it stands in the early 1960s. 1964 is a watershed in this history uh, because uh, this was when the reactionary minoritarians within a power party, without a party, gained, in fact, a new party of their own. George Wallace uh, ran for president in primaries in three northern states, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Maryland, and did strikingly well against uh, placeholders for President Lyndon Johnson. And he said something very prophetic. He said, the whole darn country is Southern. More and more, uh, the parties were, were shaking, which had previously been uh, pluralistically ideological, uh, pluralistic ideological kind of big tents. Uh, the Democrats both had liberals and conservatives. The Republicans both had liberals and conservatives were sifting into left coalitions and right coalitions. The Republican Party chose to nominate a candidate, Barry Goldwater. This is the subject of my first book, Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of the American Consensus, who was in broad sympathy with the Southern position. In his book, uh, Conscience of a Conservative, he said that it wasn't the federal government's business uh, what, South, what Southern states did in their schools. He voted against the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And uh, when he won uh, at the 1964 Republican convention in San Francisco, a delegate from Texas said something very similar to what George Wallace said after his primary successes in uh, the Democratic parties in Indiana, Wisconsin, and Maryland. He said, we took the Mason-Dixon line and we shoved it clear up to Canada. This was a very sharp observation. I mentioned in almost all my speeches about this period because the striking thing about the entire Go Water nomination movement in itself was that it was in fact a textbook example of the sort of reactionary minoritarianism we can associate most commonly with previous history only in the South. Uh, I tell the story of how Barry Goldwater won the Republican nomination. The uh, conservative operative who uh, was the leader of the campaign was named F. Clifton White. And he explained that his inspiration in winning the nomination for Barry Goldwater was the communists that he had watched take over liberal organizations in the 1940s. Um, this is a bit of a bit of a detour, but before 1972, there were very few primaries. Uh, presidents, presidential nominees of the parties were mostly chosen in, in kind of caucuses, conventions. There was a lot more uh, room for kind of backroom deals, private maneuvers. It wasn't a particularly democratic process. And what F. Clifton White described was doing things like, for example, uh, flooding meetings that usually only get five or six people with 20 people, you know, precinct meetings. He would describe uh, outlasting the Republican Party regulars by, you know, keeping the meeting going until 1 a.m. and then calling a vote, right? Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, the kind of strategies that Clifton White used to get Barry Goldwater the nomination resembled the kind of minoritarian strategies by which uh, the South guaranteed only uh, uh, Democratic presidential nominees who accorded with uh, the South's wishes. Uh, Barry Goldwater, in a very important sense, was a minority Republican Party candidate. In fact, uh, when Gallup did a poll, they found that the Republican rank and file disagreed with Barry Goldwater on four out of five of his most prominent issue positions. And uh, to put a cherry on the cake, that is when a uh, long, slow, steady process of the South uh, aligning itself with the Republican Party began. Strom Thurmond, the very leader of the Dixiecrat Revolt at the 1948 Democratic Convention, uh, joined the Republican Party uh, and ceremonially, uh, very ceremoniously uh, campaigned for Barry Goldwater. The striking thing about 
the Republican Party is that even though we have uh, in many ways uh, the pluralist nature of the Republican Party uh, really only dying out uh, completely uh, later in the 1990s. Uh, I'm speaking to an audience largely of Kentuckians and a lot of you will remember Thurston Morton. He was a, lib a moderate or even a liberal Republican Senator. And when I was doing research at the Lyndon Johnson Library in Austin, I saw correspondence between Lyndon Johnson and Thurston Morton, which made it quite plain that Thurston Morton was working for Lyndon Johnson for president instead of Barry Goldwater. So we have a very complicated, long, steady, uneven process of the conservatives uh, aligning with the Republicans and the liberals exclusively aligning with the Democrats. But one thing that accompanied this process was that an entire minoritarian reactionary bureaucracy was built within the Republican Party by its right wing in order to stymie uh, the will of the majority when it came to elections. It was called Operation Eagle Eye. And Operation Eagle Eye, which I write about in Before the Storm, uh, and I've also written about subsequently uh, in articles, um, was an operation within the Republican Party that built off the folklore that the Democrats had stolen the presidential election in 1960 uh, by uh, basically uh, having um, dead people vote in Chicago and uh, having um, ballot stuffing in Texas. Uh, they never, um, you know, really proved it. It was mostly folklore. I'm a Chicagoan and I can tell you plenty of stories that old timers have told me about corruption in Chicago, uh, but by the same token, um, no one has ever come up with any real dispositive evidence uh, one way or the other. And the real opposite uh, kind of bottom line when it comes to the question of election corruption in Chicago was very shortly after the 1960 election, there was a bipartisan commission that completely cleaned up Chicago elections. So the idea that kind of Chicago was this, you know, kind of uh, uh, rotten borough bailiwick of stolen elections, uh, were it ever true in 1960, was definitely not true in say by 1968, in which the Operation Eagle Eye operation was um, run out of the Senate office of the conservative Republican Senator Everett Dirksen. And uh, one of the main uh, methods by which um, Republicans uh, sought to keep down the vote in Democratic and liberal areas was a technique known as voter caging. Uh, how that worked was uh, you take a voter roll with thousands of name on, names on it and you send uh, a postcard uh, to that address. And if it's returned undeliverable, then you try to, on election day, keep the person at that address from voting, even if it's a postal mistake or whatever. And um, to make a long story short, in uh, 1982, a federal judge uh, in New Jersey a rule that techniques like voter caging were in fact um, not legitimate, uh, that they caused um, more repressing of legitimate votes than uh, that they found illegitimate votes. Um, and um, enormous part of um, how Republicans had been uh, seeking to depress the vote of Democratic constituencies uh, were prevented for um, several decades because of that uh, injunction from the New Jersey judge, uh, that consent decree. Um, that's when we fast forward to the present day. This is the first election in which that consent decree was expired. At the same time, it's one of the first elections in which uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled uh, in a decision uh, written by Chief Justice John Roberts uh, that a provision of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, uh, that was the law that passed in honor of the martyrs who were beaten at Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965, one of those key provisions known as preclearance was no longer required. Uh, the way preclearance worked was that anytime 
a state uh, that had been shown to be uh, um, to violate the voting rights of African Americans, anytime they changed any of their voting procedures, they would have to clear it first with the Justice Department. And uh, John Roberts decided that, that that was no longer necessary, that the Voting Rights Act had done its work, that the voter suppression was a thing of the past. And uh, so we go into the 2020 presidential election, returning to this pre-1982 Wild West in which the Republican conservative practices of minoritarian reaction were allowed free reign. 2016 was the year in which it was driven home to the Republican Party that it could win and keep power as a minority party, much as the South had won and kept power as a minority part of the country. Remember, Republicans have lost popular vote in seven out of the eight last eight elections. Trumpism is, in a sense, the institutionalization of an ideology that if the base is kept angry enough, a presidential candidate can squeeze just enough out of its minority to win the electoral college. 2020 gets us to a much uglier place in which Trump attempted his own reelection with a reactionary minoritarian strategy, a strategy that only worked because you are squeezing more and more electoral votes out of fewer and fewer popular votes. It only works by ratcheting up the apocalypticism, ratcheting up the sense among the electorate that the political opposition is so profoundly wicked that fill in the blank. To uh, use Donald Trump's favorite phrase, if this and such happens, if the opposition is allowed to have its wicked way, we won't have a country anymore. The modern cognate of the South's fear of the loss of its way of life. There's a wonderful book about the history of the Southern experience of the civil rights, the white Southern experience of the civil rights movement. It's called There Goes Our Everything. The idea that if liberal values are allowed to prevail, that if the Southern way of life goes the way of all flesh, which is to say the white Southern way of life, civilization itself, our very existential grounding in the world will go away. This is the world of QAnon. The idea that the Democratic Party is so demented and so evil that literally its leaders are involved in a cult to abscond with children in order to steal their blood. In one poll, it was found that 52% of Republican voters believe that some or all of the conspiracy theory is true. It's very similar to the kind of apocalypticism we saw in the late 1970s when it came to the extension of full civil rights to gays and lesbians in America. In 1977, the county of Dade County in Florida passed a gay rights ordinance extending civil rights protections to gays and lesbians. And the popular singer Anita Bryant led an initiative campaign to repeal it. It was known as Save Our Children. The operational theory of Save Our Children was that because quote unquote homosexuals could not reproduce that they had to recruit, that they were scooping up our children and turning them into homosexuals. Uh, Jerry Falwell came to Miami and campaigned for, my, for Anita Bryant. He said, a homosexual will just as soon look at you as kill you. Uh, there was a famous TV preacher named James Robeson. James Robeson uh, uh, said in one of his broadcasts in Texas in 1979, that not only were gays recruiting young boys, they were murdering them en masse. Uh, James Robeson uh, got kicked off his television station in Fort Worth. He became a martyr. Uh, there was a 
there was a uh, mass rally of 10,000 people to get him back on TV. The guy who organized the rally, rally was James Robeson's publicist, um, the future Arkansas governor, James Huckabee, uh, whose daughter became Donald Trump's uh, uh, spokeswoman. Uh, Mike Huckabee told the New Yorker, recalling that, uh, recalling that, that uh, rally uh, to get James Robeson back on the air. If James Robeson had looked, his, looked into the camera and, and, and told his audience to go down and tear down that TV station brick by brick, they would have done it. Donald Trump did much the same yesterday. He looked his followers in the eye and he said, I want you to tear down that Capitol brick by brick, so to speak. He ramped up the apocalypticism, the better to operationalize the reactionary minoritarian strategy of keeping power, despite the fact that he had fewer electoral votes, not to mention the fact that he had many, many, many fewer popular votes. We're not gonna have a country anymore our way of life, there goes our everything. The parliamentary strategy, the electoral strategy, the legal strategy had once more failed. And as it happened so many times in our history, the, my, the reactionary my, minoritarians reverted to force instead. That's where we find ourselves now at a pre precipice between republicanism with a small r or barbarism. Everyone in Washington, everyone in the Republican Party now faces the moral imperative to take their stand with Trump or with democracy. Tonight, when you turn off my lecture, you can turn on the cable news and find out what choice various Republican officials have made. We're at a precipice. Reactionary minoritarianism has been written into our nation's founding. So long as it remains a Republican reform of government will remain precarious. So, uncomfortable. I thank you for your patience in listening to my presentation, and I'm very eager to entertain your questions. Welcome, everybody, and again, thank you so much. Um, I think what the bulk of the questions in the chat room focus on now is could Ronald Reagan hmm. have wanted to pull anything like what happened yesterday? Such an interesting question. Was he a different kind of person? Was he a better person? Did he believe in democracy? Um, and this question is for real or was it simply performative? Um, another question that ties into this um, is, thank you for the big picture. Yesterday makes so much more sense now. How was Reagan a part of all of this? I didn't mention Reagan, did I? No, that's okay. But, yeah. but now, now yeah. is your chance. And as far as I'm concerned, um, First of all, I think I need my bourbon now. That's kind of that was kind of a strange thing. That's fine. These are the the central questions. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just spend as much time as you want sure. with them? All right. And Luckily, I've had a bit of a rehearsal for that. Yeah. Um, Ron Brownstein, the wonderful Associated Press reporter who reported a lot of these events at the Washington Post, reported on Newt Gingrich, reported on Ronald Reagan asked me that precisely that question. I, I, I wish I were, could have recorded it. I could have, could have just played you my answer. I'm gonna start by saying, by expanding the question of saying, what would Richard Nixon also mm -hmm. think about, uh, about uh, Donald Trump? Because of course he's 
part of this reactionary minoritarian. He managed to win a landslide, but of course, one of the ways he did it was by um, a conspiracy to make sure that uh, one, one of the things Watergate was about was sabotaging all the Democratic primary campaigns, except for the guy he wanted to run against, the, the, the left and most candidate, George McGovern. Um, so in the case of Richard Nixon, we have a pretty nice archive of what he thought about his opponents, what he thought about the Democratic Party, what about what he thought about liberals, and uh, a lot of what we hear, you know, coming out of the mouth of Richard Nixon on those tapes is um, quite similar to the kind of things we hear when you know Donald Trump is either <laughs> speaking on a tape or <laughs> speaking for the public, right? When we get to R Ronald Reagan, it's it's a much more complicated question because you have to ask which Ronald Reagan. The specific question that Ron Brownstein had asked me was, he, he, he quoted some of the apocalyptic things that Donald Trump has said in recent days, like what he said at um, his rally in Georgia. He said, if the Democrats win, you know, there goes our country. Literally that Democrats, let alone liberal Democrats, are um, so demented that we cannot exist as a country anymore with, you know, uh, the party of Antifa, you know, um, running the government, right? And so he asked me about, you know, did, did Ronald Reagan believe in that kind of apocalypticism? And, you know, he, he covered Ronald Reagan and, and he was kind of, kind of nodding along when I pointed out that when Ronald Reagan started his, you know, kind of public career as a, as a, as a political speaker instead of an actor, he said that kind of stuff all the time, right? He would say, uh, he would quote the John Birch Society uh, Blue Book and say that Lenin said that, you know, America will fall like an overripe fruit into our hands, you know, once we kind of, you know, get, you know, by, 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 by pushing liberal reforms one after the other. You know, he, 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 he would say that um, we have until 1970 and then the Soviet Union is going to make an ultimatum and then we have to decide whether the world is going to be all slave or all free. You know, the kind of extremist stuff we associate with you know, um, people who were basically, you know, kicked out of the mainstream of the Republican Party. So this is the early 60s. And then he runs for governor in 1966. And don't forget that, you know, one of the main reasons he won the governor's race in 1966 was uh, using the student radicals uh, at Berkeley specifically as his foil. You know, he would, he, he would say, you know, I want to harness that youthful enthusiasm with a strap. You know, he would say, you know, and then when he was governor and, uh, you know, um, the Antifa of 1970, you know, the new left, which was actually, in fact, you know, quite apocalyptic in its rhetoric. And, you know, there were leaders who would say things like, you know, we, you know, uh, want America to, you know, go down in flames and we're with the Viet Cong and all the rest. He once said something like, um, if there's going to be a bloodbath, let's get it over with, right? Uh, so he was very apocalyptic. Uh, and then, um, you know, as he kind of enters uh, his kind of post-public, post-public post, post -public official phase as a, a, a newspaper columnist, as a speaker, as a radio commentator in the 1970s, I write about that in both Reaganland and my last book on the Invisible Bridge, um, he would say crazy apocalyptic stuff, you know, all the time, you know, he would, he would say the National Education Association is, is getting their idea from, for a national curriculum from Hitler, right? So it's not, it's not quite anti-democratic. And I think he had a lot of faith in democratic, you know, small d institutions, right? Um, but the same token, a lot of the people he gladly allied himself with were, 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 you know, the same kind of Southern demagogues you know, that I've talked about in my lecture, right? And he, he was, you know, against the 1964 Civil Rights Act. He was against the 1966 Open Housing Act. He said you should have the right to, you know, rent your house to whoever he wanted to. And then of course, uh, both in the 1970s and then as president, he aligned himself with um, the forces of white minority rule in Africa. And now here's the complicated thing. It's, 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 it's um, when I say which Reagan you're talking about, I did an article in the New Republic uh, in which I compared the letters that Ronald Reagan signed that were written by his staff when he was running for president that went out to people like newspaper columnists, uh, intellectuals, 
uh, uh, other you know moderate politicians, you know people like Pete DuPont, the the governor of of um, uh, Delaware, and you know they they sounded like you know completely in the mainstream of of public opinion, not extreme at all. And I would compare those to I compared those in the article and also in the book to the letters he would dictate to his to his friends, right? And he would sound like the same old crazy John Birch Society guy, right? So and this is an important uh, <laughs> this is this is an important um, this is basically the most important, profound structural difference between the world of Ronald Reagan and the world of Donald Trump. Um, Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon, uh, whatever they believed about how the world should work, they had a very um, complicated, sophisticated, one might even say mature grasp of uh, compartmentalization that you don't just kind of blunder forth in the public and say exactly what you think whenever you think it. Ronald Reagan knew to surround himself with all sorts of handlers and retainers who he would consult about what it was okay to say, what it wasn't okay to say. And what he intended as his agenda, you know, uh, both in the case of Nixon and Reagan, Nixon is a really interesting case, right? So Nixon is the guy who's famous for, you know, starting the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, signing all sorts of liberal legislation. Well, of course he did. He was dealing with a you know, a Congress that was almost two to one democratic, you know, the dominant institutions of the society were still liberal, right? The one time he tried to veto an environmental bill, you know, it was overridden. It was not that he loved environmentalism. He said they wanted to send us back to live into trees, you know, but he understood what he could accomplish politically. Now, if you want to understand what he wanted to do, what he dreamed of doing, look at his budget after he won his 1972 landslide. That looked like something that Ronald Reagan would have, you know, put forward. It was basically a budget that attempted to destroy the Great Society, to destroy the New Deal. That's what he wanted to use his political capital to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. Um, so the same with Ronald Reagan. He he was dealing with, you know, House of Representatives run by you know Tip O'Neill, right? Um, not only are Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan very different people, that Ronald Reagan, <laughs> she, can, she can stand. <laughs> uh, not only did not only did Ronald Reagan, <clears throat> not only did Ronald Reagan, you know, kind of surround himself with, you know, handlers that he listened to. He, um, you know, was basically working in a Washington that still had lots of liberal, you know, kind of guardrails and institutions. Donald Trump's working in a Washington, you know. A conservative movement 40 years on, in which basically um, the kind of reactionary minoritarianism has become almost hegemonic, you know, within Washington, D.C. itself. It's not only that the case that Donald Trump says whatever he wants, whenever he wants, because he's Donald Trump. It's also because he's surrounded by a party um, in which those kind of guardrails against that kind of extremism have, you know, slowly worn away. You know, even its most institutional members, you know, uh, the Lindsey Grahams, the Mitch McConnells, you know, go along with him. And <clears throat> I'm a little, not quite as eloquent as I was. You'll have to, you'll have to, you guys all have to read Ron Brownstein's article when it comes out. Let me just make one more point. Um, the, um, the, <laughs> my, my, my own wife is giggling at me back here, back there. Um, the, um, the generation that Ronald Reagan was part of and, and, and Richard Nixon was a part of had World War II, had the rise of Nazi Germany, had genocide as a living memory. They had also the ugliness of massive resistance in the South as a living memory, you know, lynchings as a living memory. They understood in a very visceral way what would happen if a demagogue gave free reign to the most ugly impulses within the human species? What could happen when you open that Pandora's box? Today's generation of Republicans, there's always been a very careful negotiation. This much demagoguery, but no further. You know, Barry Goldwater, when he ran for president, first of all, he didn't want to be president. So that was kind of an interesting variable right there. But he went to Lyndon Johnson. The first urban race riot happened 
in 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 um, in in Harlem right after the Republican convention. And he went to the White House and said, if people start exploiting race riots to get me elected, I'll quit. This is how careful they were about the idea of, you know, um, weaponizing that sort of feral kind of primal white rage, right? It terrified them, right? Richard Nixon said similar things. He said, I got to do this stuff or else the fascists will take over, right? Um, when George W. Bush said, Islam is a religion of peace, he understood that if he did said anything different, we might be talking about anti-Islamic pogroms, right? Uh, Mitt Romney, when he was running in 2012, said, no one has to look at my birth certificate. He did indulge the birther canard in a Trump-like fashion, but then he apologized. He backed off. So a big part of the history I'm talking about is that sort of um, guardrail wearing away. And now we are where we are now. And people are trying to close Pandora's box. Lane Chow is trying to close Pandora's box. You know, his former chief of staff are trying to close Pandora's box. But as anyone who, you know, lived through the 1940s tells you, you know, once you, once you touch that nerve, you grasp at that ring, you're talking about something that's ugly, ugly. Earlier today on NPR's 1A, there was a discussion uh, on the question that I'm going to read to you. It's not whiskey. Um, it's a very important question, and it ties into what you just were discussing. With so many news outlets and social media platforms, how do we keep them from... Um, well, that's, that's another question. And still uphold the First Amendment. Well, that's a very tough question. And that's another <clears throat> big structural question, right? A lot of what was going on in the South was under the radar, right? Uh, you didn't have the kind of, you know, kind of social media. But one of the reasons that um, brought the ugliness of the South and turned, um, you know, Southern racial terrorism to a national problem was the fact that the three networks were sending reporters down there, right? With but there wasn't, you know, a counter Southern network saying, "Oh, well, we're only doing this because uh, these people are getting instructions from Moscow and we're saving America from collapse," right? Um, you had, you know, those three authoritative, centurion white men every night telling you what reality looked like, and that. You know, on the one hand, sort of disciplined um, some of the rough edges of the social body at the same time as it had some ugly consequences too. I mean, those were the guys who also helped get us into Vietnam, right? Now we have, you know, Fox, which is a very ugly thing. We have a billionaire literally, you know, weaponizing this kind of demagoguery for his own, to enrich himself. I mean, it's, 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 it's like some kind of a science fiction movie, right? You have social media, and you have the challenge of um, uh, anyone being able to say anything to anyone. And believe me, you know, I've looked at some of the kind of back channel communications of the folks who are going to Washington. And <laughs> this is not just random. <laughs> you know, this is that there, there, are, there are battle plans, right? Um, so it's a very tough question. Uh, and any, I'll, I'll just conclude by pointing out that um, Anytime you write about this sort of history, media is an actor in the story. Media is a player in the story, right? It's not merely this kind of neutral conduit. One last question. And for all of you who've asked questions, I so apologize because- I'm glad to get your emails at nixonland at gmail.com. I noticed that someone put that on the chat. Nixonland at gmail.com and believe me, he'll respond. Um, Is that Todd Babbitts from the uh, Nicolay class of 1987? Anyway. All right. Where do you see the Republican Party going from here after yesterday's, uh, and the question is, uh, the language is attempted coup. And, oh, oh there, yeah. and do you... And I'll add to that because, you know, we in Kentucky are familiar with Henry Clay, of course, and mm -hmm. the demise of the Whig Party. Yeah. 
uh, the silliness of the know nothing party, but the danger of it. Um, where do you see the Republican party going and how do you envision or see the importance of a two party system in this country? Mm. 50 words or less, right? Please. No, no, not really. Keep going. We've got till 7.05. Yeah. Um, well, one of the fascinating things about the role of the quote unquote Republican Party in all this is they're in a terrible position. I mean, they made their bed, they have to lie in it, right? But um, every time a Republican does the responsible thing and says, I'm not going to go along with the coup, I'm not going to go along with uh, faithless electors, I'm not going to go along with the conspiracy theory. Um, they play into the narrative that they're, you know, part of the deep state. You know, they're 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 part of the problem. And quite literally, we're talking about people with guns who, you know, have an apocalyptic vision of the world, and they've suddenly be gone over to the other side. So it's, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat that. It's a very ugly situation, right? So what happens to the Republican Party that's kind of relied for its success and its ability to kind of um, both weaponize demagoguery, but also kind of maintain um, this um, institutional stability, right? Uh, kind of riding that tiger. Um, you know, I don't have a, 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 a good answer to that. Um, the, it's an excellent question. What, why do we need a, a, you know, a two-party system? In a lot of ways, it's, it's interesting. We do have a two-party system. It's called the Democratic Party. I mean, it's like we have a very plural Democratic Party with a left wing and a right wing that, you know, kind of a lot, in a lot of ways kind of uh, carry out the functions of a two-party system. You know, the, it's not going to go too far because it's a centrist. You know, it's not going to get too sclerotic because it has the left wing. Um, and, but, um, you know, the Whig party, you know, um, only, you know, it only lasts for like, you know, what, like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, right? Um, and um, parties go away. Um, I don't have the wisdom to know what's going to happen next. I don't even have the conceptual tools to know what's happening next. So I guess my answer is just to be really, really open and really, really observant about what's happening. Um, these resignations are fascinating. You know, the the the, the McConnell Cho family, uh, Chow family, uh, uh, your homeboys are are um, fascinating. You know, um, bellwethers, right? I mean, here's a guy who went all in with Trump. I mean, here's a woman who went in all in with Trump's cabinet. Does that mean that they're damaged goods forever? Uh, maybe in a just world, they would be, right? Um, but they've also delivered a lot for Kentuckians, right? I mean, I'm sure you ride on freeways every day. They wouldn't be there without his good offices. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, I'm just stumped. I'm, I'm, I have no problem saying I'm stumped. You know, I mean, you, you catch me on a, a day in which I'm doing a lot of reading and I'm doing a lot of listening, and that's what we all have to do. Rick, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you all for being with us this evening on this momentous day following one of the most momentous days in the nation's history. Well, it speaks very well to the Filson Society that they can, you know, kind of sponsor a, a true exchange about a very complicated time in our history. So I'm very grateful to you. Well, let me say our mission is to collect preserve and tell the stories of Kentucky and Ohio Valley history. But underlying all of that is a more basic important mission and that is um, to teach the American story and in doing so to preserve and protect and defend our democracy. Thank you. I'm with you. Thank you.